Good morning, afternoon, and, e and or evening, um, depending on where you are. And thanks for joining us for this webinar. My name is Caitlin Lustick. I work for the Nature Conservancy's Florida chapter and support the Reef Resilience Network. And I'll be your host for this webinar. This webinar will be one hour and 15 minutes, and we've built in time for a question and answer session at the end. You'll be hearing from four experts on how to incorporate information about coral reef connectivity into management decisions. First, we'll hear from Dr. Anique Cross. Anique is the science and training specialist for the Reef Resilient Resilience Network. She is a marine biologist with expertise in coral reef conservation. Anique transplanted her first coral nubbin to build reef resilience in Mombasa, Kenya in 2002 as part of her master's thesis for Newcastle University in the UK and has worked on innovative approaches to coral reef management ever since. She has a PhD from the University of Hawaii in conservation genetics and 20 years international experience working on spatial planning, the design of marine protected areas, MPA networks, and integrating climate change into coral reef conservation. Next, we'll hear from Nicole Crane. Nicole is a senior conservation scientist with One People, One Reef, an executive director of the David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellowship at the Society for Conservation Biology, a program that supports applied conservation postdoc fellows. Her primary areas of conservation focus are on community-led coral reef conservation and management. The One People, One Reef Collaborative is focused on authentic collaboration and co-creation of action plans with indigenous and local communities developing conservation and management tools aimed at protecting reefs and the people who rely on them. And Nicole has some special guests that will be joining her and she will be introducing them during her, um, her talk. Next, we'll, we'll have Dr. Courtney Cox. Courtney has a PhD in coral reef ecology and extensive expertise in assessing fisheries management strategies and uh, identifying factors driving ecological and social change. She has supported teams across 12 countries in enhancing data collection methods, designing protected areas, and implementing efficient adaptive management approaches. She is the founder and director of Barefoot Ocean, a social enterprise dedicated to empowering individuals, communities, governments, and local organizations with science and data. And finally, we'll hear from June Amalo. June possesses more than two decades of expertise in coastal resource management initiatives, spanning diverse sectors, including academia, national governmental bodies, and non-governmental organizations. His professional journey has been deeply rooted in the Philippines, notably focusing on the Visayas and Mindanao regions. Presently, June holds the position of Director in Marine Science and Governance at RAIR, where he has dedicated his efforts for the past 11 years. Next slide, Sherry. In case anyone is unfamiliar with Zoom webinars, here are a few housekeeping items. On the left, you'll see an audio settings button. You can click on the up arrow and select from available audio output options, such as speakers, headphones, or other Bluetooth device devices. If you exper experience any technical difficulties, such as not being able to see the slides or to hear us, please use the chat feature to send a private message to Sherry Wagner or myself, and we will be able to assist you. After each set of speakers, we'll have five minutes for, present, for questions, and then we'll have a full Q&A session at the end. You can use the Q&A feature throughout the webinar to type any questions you have for the presenter. You can do that either with your name attached or anonymously. And then during the Q&A session after the presentations, you can also raise your hand um, using the raise hand feature if you'd like to be unmuted to ask your question yourself. So first we'd like to get a sense of who's with us today. So um, we have a we have two poll questions. First, please tell us where you work. Uh, in the Caribbean Atlantic, the Coral Triangle, the Pacific, the Red Sea, the Western Indian Ocean, or other. And you can choose more than one. Okay, so we have mostly from the Pacific, which we assumed uh, because of the timing, but also a pretty good um, showing from the Caribbean and the Coral Triangle. 
Okay, and then for the second question, uh, we just wanna get a better sense of what type of work that you do. So the question is, are you primarily a marine resource manager or practitioner, scientist or researcher, student or other? Okay, great. So we have mostly scientists or researchers followed by marine managers um, and some students and other. Thanks for that. That helps our speakers um, understand a little bit more about where people are calling in from and what their roles are with um, their organizations. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker, which is Anik Cross. Go ahead, Anik. Thanks, Caitlin, for this great intro. Um, Today, before moving on to our other experts, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about why we're doing a webinar on coral reef connectivity and some of the challenge we've had um, throughout the years. So marine connectivity has been a topic of interest uh, for coral reef managers for over three decades. And it often seems like the holy grail for data for marine protected areas design. Um, as we increasingly prioritize reef resilience and the maintenance of coral reef services, connectivity once again emerges as a critical focal point, uh, both for the design and management of MPA and MP network. Serving as a cornerstone of resilience, connectivity plays a pivotal role in the supporting coral reef structure and biodiversity and sustaining fisheries. And additionally, understanding connectivity provides crucial insights into where restoration efforts can yield the greatest impact. While connectivity can often be effectively understood through local and traditional knowledge, um, accessing information on connectivity remains a challenge for manager in the scope of their work. They frequently rely on scientists to gather or create the necessary data, However, this can lead to a frustrating process where the information provided by scientists may not precisely align with the management needs and where managers may struggle to fully grasp the potential contribution of scientists. So the goal uh, of today's webinar is to offer insight into two approaches to understanding connectivity. It provides a practical overview of the process of getting the data, includes questions that data can and cannot address, and provide a brief case study illustrating application of each uh, of the management scenarios. Next. So what is the definition of connectivity? Defined by the extent to which population are linked by the exchange of eggs, larval recruits, juvenile, or adults. Next. Um, and there's often two types of connectivity that are thought of. One is evolutionary connectivity, where gene flows between different populations over many generations, and it shapes the genetic diversity within species. And the other one is demographic connectivity, where there's a movement of individuals between population, which affects the demographic and dynamics of those population. Next. And so for today, that's really what we're going to focus on. Next slide. So studies on connectivity help answer common management questions such as which area should we prioritize for protection, which reefs as, as, act as important larval sources and contribute the most to resilience of the system. Uh, similarly, for reef restoration, which are the areas where there should be outplanting to maximize the benefit of restoration? Next. So why is it so difficult to be able to answer these questions and assess connectivity? Well, most reef associated species are stuck to the bottom like corals or a sedentary like most reef fish. Most disperse through their pelagic fate, which occurs during sexual reproduction, resulting in a pelagic larvae. This is particularly important because not only is it the opportunity to disperse, but it's the opportunity to disperse new genetic material that contributes to resilience. Unfortunately, that pelagic larvae of most marine species is tiny, so it's very hard to track. Um, it's difficult to assess the length of time it stays in the water column because it behaves differently in C2 and in lab settings. And while many of them may be caught in um, common currents, uh, major currents, 
We know that most pelagic now can swim, uh, respond to cues to settle, and control buoyancy. So they can be caught around reefs in small eddies that will either retain them or can make them flow uh, counter-current-wise. So it's complicating com um, uh, predicting their dispersal pathway. And additionally, there's thousands of larvae produced during single uh, dispersal events. So it makes it really difficult to track parentage. And uh, all of that translated not knowing with certainty where larvae travel and how they shape the reefs around them. Next. So what have managers done without a lot of data? Well, one, they've turned to local and traditional knowledge, uh, looking, knowing areas of recruitment or fishes' knowledge of spending sites. Throughout the years, we've been getting more and more data, and so scientists have been coming up with rules of thumb, like the Mora et al. paper, who done studies on connectivity, saying that 15 kilometer spacing between MPA was uh, the most efficient, or simply looking like at major currents. Next. But we've made a lot of progress since uh, all of this. And so today, we actually have two guest speakers who will be presenting two different approaches to connectivity, going from a local island scale using population genetics to a much broader regional, regional scale, sorry, uh, using hydrodynamic models. So now we'll pass the presentation to Nicole. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for coming to the webinar. Um, first, I want to introduce um, colleagues of mine who I believe Magul John Rumwal is here. I'm not quite sure. Um, who's really the, the person who's sort of supported all of this work on the atoll of Ulithi in Yap State, where we work. Dr. Jason Johns will be speaking with me today. Um, he's our postdoctoral researcher uh, with One People, One Reef, splitting his time between University of California, Santa Cruz and University of California, Santa Barbara, and in the field with us, of course, in Yap State. Next. So I'm just going to start before I get into anything here by thanking the people of Yap um, and Ulithi Atoll in particular for sharing their remarkable story with the world. They have opened their ocean, their houses, their islands to us and have worked very, very closely with us in solving, first identifying and solving some of the management challenges that they've had over the years. We've been working there for a little over 10 years now, and um, they're just remarkable people doing amazing things. And so I just wanna thank them before I go on anymore. Um, just to situate us here, where we work is in Yap State, which is uh, south of Japan, east, uh, just east and north of, east and north of Palau. It's one of the four states of the Federated States of Micronesia. Next. Yap consists of many, many outer islands. It's a vast archipelago um, in a giant, otherwise empty West Pacific Ocean. Um, it's a real conservation opportunity and a place that has been understudied and under-resourced. Um, we've done most of our work on the atoll of Ulithi, which is approximately 30 kilometers long and about 16 kilometers wide um, inside the lagoon, about 580 square kilometers of, of ocean. It's the fourth largest lagoon in the world. So I just want to point out here, um, just to situate you, because we're going to be coming back to this map. In the north, you will see, maybe you can't read it, Mogmog and Asor and Falalup. And these are inhabited islands, as is one to the south here called Federai. I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. Um, so there are four inhabited islands in this otherwise giant atoll. Um, and we're going to be talking a bit about how the reefs are very different in the different parts of the atoll. Next. So I want to just bring us back here to a people-centered approach to management. Um, all the work that we do is led by the people of Ulithi and Yap. Um, the world really is a socio-ecological system, and the diverse ecosystems of our planet are really linked to the diverse traditional practices of people. And as we lose those traditional practices, we also lose some diversity. There are consequences to that. So our work really centers on traditional practices while understanding the need for adaptation in a changing world today, both with climate change, and with socioeconomic changes. So we are, we're aware that it's not a fairy tale. We're also aware that people can't always rely on only traditional systems because the world's a different place, but connecting those things stands to reach a lot more people and achieve a lot more success. If we don't put people at the center of some of these initiatives, they stand to not be nearly as successful. Next. So we'll talk a bit here about connectivity and what it is, and, and I'm actually gonna present here a couple of different um, types of, of approaches that we've used to connectivity. Um, 
It, we can do different spatial scales, as Anik mentioned, an island, an atoll, an archipelago, depending on what you're using. Um, Courtney is going to be talking about some of the larger scale approaches using uh, currents. Um, and then also there are different temporal scales, whether you're looking at evolutionary time, as Anik mentioned, or sort of generational time. And I think all of these um, connectivity studies are really based on what managers are trying to achieve in the work that they're doing. Um, what we can say in some cases and what we cannot say, for example, in the work that we'll be presenting today, we cannot really talk about directionality. In other words, we can say north-south, we can't say from north to south or from south to north. Um, managers might have a goal to see how sort of healthy reefs might impact less healthy reefs or vice versa, looking at resilience. Um, they might be interested in reservoirs or sources of healthy corals um, to, for example, seed or populate places that are less healthy or may have bleached. Um, and in our case, we're very interested in how management can be connected between jurisdictions. Um, sources and sinks are important to identify, um, but those can also change as physical parameters change. Species get introduced, reefs get degraded, currents change. So those parameters can change. And so the context of the work also needs to be taken into consideration. Um, those are all science-based prioritizations, and I'm just going to point us to that lower statement there, a people-based prioritization plan, because that's what we're using. So we're asking the people first about what they're most interested in and what they're most concerned about on their reefs, so we can put it into the context of what they most need. Next. This is a map here. This is, this is the reason why I don't want anything to do with um, developing these management plans. This is the jurisdiction, clan jurisdictions of the, of the reefs of Ulithi. Um, they're extremely complicated. They're based in a, in a vast and, and complex history. And for me to come in and say, well, there should be an MPA here or an MPA there based on the science is really going to be counterproductive because the management system and clan jurisdictions are what drive this. And in Ulithi, as in many Pacific islands, those jurisdictions and, and the management itself is very socially based. Um, it's based in a deep social foundation, not really a direct biological or ecological foundation. So if we come in and try to present that perspective, it's not going to do very well when, when you're trying to, to talk with people who are really much more socially based in their management. However, if we can overlay our ecological maps, let's say, and the data we're collecting with the social one, it does open up new ways and new insights into the importance of adaptive management. So that's really where, where we are with our work. Next. So we're going to talk about three things here, um, a problematic coral. So the, one of the first things that the people mentioned to us was that there was a coral that they were worried about. So we're going to talk about a population genomics approach to looking at that coral. Uh, where do corals and fish go and come from, a molecular ecology approach. And then I'm going to finish up with a brief introduction to or brief conclusion as to how we're using eDNA. So just a little bit of context here. Remember, genetics really is the study of genes, things like heredity, contributing to disease. Genomics is a much newer approach due to much better computational power and technology that we have today. Um, studies of the whole genome, how genes are related to one another, how genomes change over time. Population genomics then um, can determine gene flow and migration, looking at average movement of individuals over many generations. So we can look at how populations change, which can give us some insights into how they're changing, for example, under climate change regimes. Um, However, those tend to be over longer time scales. Um, we can also use molecular ecology using a more forensic approach um, to look at parentage, for example, or kinship analysis, which is what we did here. So looking at who on which reefs are related to who, so you can see where they might've come from. So that's sort of the source and sink piece. Um, next. So back to this map, I just want to point out that Ulithi has very different reefs. And so those northern reefs up there are very different than the western reefs on this map. So I'm going to show you some pictures here and relate them back to this map of the atoll. Next. So you'll see three circles down at the bottom. The one on the far right, this mostly orange, are the reefs that are at the top of Ulithi Atoll for the most part, where people live, so close to the villages. And that orange color is Montipera Capitata, or a close relative thereof. Um, and it's growing in a very weedy fashion on those reefs, overtaking other corals, creating a monospecific reef that fish don't tend to like. So this is problematic for people. Although there's lots of coral, it turns out to be a problem coral. In the middle there, you see um, uh, reefs that have some of that Montipera, but they've also got much more diversity. And on the, the left circle, we see um, much more branching corals, so really healthy reefs, uh, mostly on the western side of the atoll. Um, next. 
And the fish biomass mirrors that. So in those healthy reefs, you see cluster one, lots of fish. In the less healthy reefs, cluster three, we see much lower fish. So I'm showing you this uh, just by way of saying that we characterized these reefs before we started looking at connectivity to better understand the differences in the reefs that were there. Next. So here's Montipora, and you can see that it has taken over this reef. Um, the, the people don't like it, it tends to drive fish down, it also takes away octopus hiding holes. Um, so we decided to take a look at this and, you know, you might want to consider doing this, for example, after you've done a connectivity study to look at what reefs might be connected to others and then target on either a problem organism or maybe one you want to learn more about. We focus on this problem organism. Next. So initially, so here's a, this, this coral seems to grow crazy weedy in, the, in those northern sites. This is the western reef, and you can see how diverse these corals are on those western reefs. Um, there is that same Montipora here, but it doesn't behave the same way. So this was really interesting to us. Next. Um, so this is the first thing we did was to see if the Montipora in these different sites was the same species, because corals can be so plastic and, and it can be sometimes difficult to, to detect differences. And you can see the blue is one species and the orange is another. So there are two cryptic species that we found out there, although the orange one is far more common and that's the one we focused on. Next. And you can see the blue sites there are those sites that are in the north um, compared to the red sites on the west. So we wanted to compare those more pristine red sites with the really degraded and Montipra dominated northern sites and, and see if we could find differences there. Next. And differences we did find. So this is a complicated um, uh, figure. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I want to point your attention to the left side on the top. And you can see there isn't a lot of population structure at those different sites. So those are all the sites laid out there from Falalip to Yalil. Not lots of population structure that we could find. However, on the left, sorry, on the right side, we do see that there were um, evidence of adaptation, um, 86 loci were under selection. And we were able to functionally classify five of those. So you'll see that on, the, on that um, figure on the top of the right, on the left side of that figure, there's more orange than on the right side of that figure. So we saw definite differences. And in fact, those sites that were in blue in the north part of the lagoon with all that Montipra growing like crazy, that was the stuff that was under rapid selective pressure. So our, our, we, we consider possibly that those populations are responding actually quite well to climate change or to otherwise what we might consider unfavorable conditions. So there was a concern that those corals might move around, the, the bad ones, let's say, and start dominating in other sites. So here's where connectivity becomes important. So I'm gonna bring Jason in here now to talk about his connectivity graphs. All right, next slide, please. So we can do that kinship analysis that Nicole has been talking about by sequencing the genomes of a bunch of different individuals across the atoll, which is getting cheaper and easier to do by the month. Um, so when we sequence all these individuals, we can compare each individual to the others in the population, and determine their kinship, and put that on a map to show connectivity. So are they related enough to assume that they're full siblings? Are they just half siblings or are they unrelated? And so these dots and lines here are showing those relationships. The dots are relationships between individuals from the same island and the lines are connecting individuals from different islands. And so the red dots and lines are showing full sibling relationships, the orange half siblings and, and gray distantly related individuals. So here we're looking again at that invasive coral species, Montipra. And interestingly here, one of the first things we notice is that islands that are close together aren't necessarily the most connected. Um, we see high levels of connectivity from north to south, even from islands that are really far apart. Um, and so one of our fearless leaders that Nicole mentioned, Magul Rulmal, who's from Ulithi, was really excited when he first saw this map because it turns out that these patterns of genetic connectivity really parallel traditional patterns of social connectivity. So it turns out that these islands are co-managing their reefs on multiple levels, and we're able to, to visualize that with these data. So for a species like Montipara that uh, stays in one place, these patterns are largely driven by currents, um, but it may have to do with dynamics of, of adaptation and competition 
um, which is where the analysis that Cole just discussed uh, can come in handy. Next slide, please. So we can do this for fish too. And, uh, and this clownfish species, uh, we see a similar pattern to what we saw with the coral, similar to Montipora, where they, they disperse at the larval stage and then stay put. And we're seeing uh, some strong connectivity from north to south. On the next slide, we see a slightly different pattern with a, a closely related but different species. And this is where we can start to potentially visualize dynamics of competition and, and habitat preference. So if a particular island is not connected to other islands, it can be due to various factors. But one of those factors can, can be due to um, a low adaptation to a particular site or high levels of, of competition. So coral or fish larvae can, can recruit from outside the atoll, but if they're poorly adapted or and or outcompeted, then they won't reproduce and, and thus they won't disperse offspring to other islands in the atoll. And so each one of these recruitment events will be independent from outside the atoll. And this is the kind of thing that we can start to visualize with this map. Next. So this species shows high connectivity across the atoll with a, a pretty different pattern than what we've seen before with Montipora and the other clownfish species. And this shows the importance of, of sampling different species with different dispersal methods and different life histories across the atoll. Um, this can also be done for pelagic species. We're, we're showing this for species that stay put the rest of their life. Um, so importantly too, directionality isn't inherent in these data, right? We can say that they're connected from north to south um, but we can't say that they're coming from the north to the south source to sink. Um, but this is something that we can account for if we know something about the age of the individuals that we're collecting. So we've, we're showing these maps from clownfish and corals, but there's a lot of fish species that are really important to eulithians. And as we speak, my background is blurred out, but I'm in the lab right now generating those data um, at the moment from some fish species that are really important to to local people and now we'll pass it back to nicole to talk about some resilience you're muted nicole <laughs> just a really brief foray into um, resilience um, we have this one reef here in the north of the lagoon that was highly degraded and highly damaged and uh, we started to see um, a uh, coral dependent fish show up there and a recovery of some of the corals and this sort of amazing resilience happened. Next. And so we wanted to try to understand what was happening out there. We suspect these the corals are coming from some of those really pristine western reefs. We, we do know there's some connectivity between those. So we decided to look at some eDNA, which is a really relatively fast and inexpensive way to, to, to look at biodiversity at a site. So you can see there in 2014 and 2015 how degraded that site was. And by 2023, and it happened literally in three years, um, what happened to that site? Next. So in the eDNA, it's really fast, easy. Jason actually collected it. Um, uh, take a liter of water and, and, and filter it and ship it off. And you can see we did two samples per site and the samples came out the same. So this is just showing you consistency between the samples. So our sample size was small and not so expensive. Next. And what you get is a beautiful colored circle of all the things that you can find at the different sites. And so this is just one piece of the analysis, but you can really take a look at how these sites differ or are the same across space. Um, and you can also do it across time. So this is really a good indicator along with connectivity to take a look at resilience and, and what might be happening on the reefs through time. Next. And I want to just point out that the financial and logistical considerations are getting easier. This is Giacomo Bernardi. He set up his um, molecular lab there in the infirmary on the island, um, collecting his samples, and he sequenced genomes right there in the infirmary. So the, the logistics are getting a lot simpler, and the costs are coming much uh, down quite quickly. Next. I'll let Jason go through this. It's not a, it's kind of a long slide, but um, we can do it really quickly. Yeah, so we put together a, a general list of the procedures and that go into these analyses, what they cost to do. Um, so I won't read these to you, but we wanted to put this together because these this slide deck will be available after the webinar. Um, but just to point out generally, as with most things, it's 
it can be cheaper to do it yourself. Um, but mostly if you have some of the tools to, to and are already set up to do it. Um, and so that's where collaborations with labs that are already set up to do this work can come in handy. These make for great projects and, and funding sources for graduate students um, for a term or two. I can speak from experience. Um, but again, these numbers change really quickly and they always go down. And so it's becoming more and more feasible to just collect the tissue and send it off to a lab and have them return an analysis, kind of like what we did uh, with the eDNA work. And so Nicole, more importantly, where does this land us? Okay, next. So this lands us back to people. And um, what we're doing with all this work is to try to integrate it into a broader tool that puts connectivity in the context of other things that people are interested in, you know, coral cover and fish, biomass and all sorts of stuff. We're doing isotope work. So um, let me have the next slide here. So we're developing this spatial visualization tool and you can see that reef connectivity is a piece of that as a way for people to visualize what's happening on their reefs over space and over time. Um, to be able to layer these different things on top of one another or look at them separately, depending on what people are most interested in seeing. So they can make decisions about their management. And again, the, if people understand the reefs from these kinds of perspectives, they can start working from where they really sit, which is from their own social and ecological and management perspectives. And we, we, we see a much greater a longevity to those plans. And in some cases we've seen um, results in less than a year when people just take action very quickly on some of their reefs. Next. So back to this um, slide briefly again, um, showing that the, it's the jurisdictions and the people who manage them and the relationships between the clans that really drive all of this. And our science really supports it rather than leads it. Next. So we are looking, as Jason mentioned, at some new fish. They're very interested in, in this type of parrotfish. So this is next on the docket for Jason's work, looking at connectivity um, in this fish. And so we've selected a few fish that they've really decided they want to learn more about. And next, and I think we're down to the end here. So in summary, genomics can tell us something about how populations expand and adapt, how individuals move, the evolution and adaptation of populations on a spatial scale. EDNA can help us understand presence and absence of species and how similar sites are or different, like a biodiversity comparison. Costs are coming down quickly. There's resources to help with analysis and with data collection and processing, and work can be done in remote locations now more than ever. Next. And last. So thanks so much, everybody, and looking forward to questions. Thanks, Nicole. Courtney, we'll start yours and we'll do all the questions and answer session at the end. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. And hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here today to discuss um, our efforts over the past few years, integrating connectivity into decision making processes for area based management. Next, please. Okay, so we've been working on a modeling approach to understanding connectivity. Um, so larvae can travel long distances, ending up in very far off places um, or back to where they started. Um, our focus has been to simulate these dispersal patterns and understand how larval transport links coral, fish, and other invertebrate populations, um, the implications of those connections, and how managers can use this information. Um, adult populations, for instance, um, could potentially be influenced by fishing activities well beyond community fishing areas um, through the connectivity modeling. Uh, we can provide data to aid in the protection of larval hotspots. Um, and protecting these hotspots can enhance ecosystem recovery and sustainability, as well as support the livelihoods of the communities that depend on them. Um, so as, as Nicole also mentioned, um, we are focused on providing data that can be used alongside other ecological, social, and fisheries data to make decisions um, with the communities at, at always at the center um, of, the, of the efforts in the data. Next, please.
So our objective has been to provide resource managers with a versatile decision support tool that can be used across geographical scales in the species. Um, we can use connectivity to support international commitments such as 30 by 30. Um, these can provide crucial input for national policies and planning processes like marine spatial planning. Um, and the data can be used to design networks of marine protected areas or other area-based management tools, as well as provide input into zoning strategies with, within those areas. Um, this multi-scale and multi-species approach um, can empower resource managers to strengthen ecosystem resilience by pinpointing optimal locations for both conservation and fisheries management efforts at national, regional, and local scales. Next. So over the past couple of years, um, we've been working on using this approach um, in, in a wide variety of geographies. Um, we've used this approach to, across 14 countries. Uh, we've modeled 32 species groups. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute, what I mean by species group. Um, so from the Caribbean um, all the way over to Palau and FSM, um, we've developed larval dispersal models to help managers um, use these data in decision-making um, around area-based management. Next. And when I say we, um, this has been a big team of, of folks that has been involved um, in developing this approach, um, developing the connectivity metrics that we're using and, and how we're using them, um, both from the academic side and the practitioner side. Um, so some of the key folks that have been involved in developing the, the approach um, are those listed at the bottom. Um, we're in, in close collaboration um, with these, these academic minds. Um, and then the rare country teams um, who were our folks on the ground um, who are making sure it made sense um, and could work in, in, in practice. And we'll be hearing from, from June in a bit on some examples of that. Um, so we're excited to be, to be partnering um, with many organizations um, to develop scientifically sound strategies um, that, can, that can work in the field. Next. Okay, so there are two primary ways that we can think about and visualize larval dispersal. Um, where do larvae go and where do they come from? Um, the ultimate products are maps showing important export or source areas. Um, where do they go? And important import or sink areas, where do they come from? So to get there, um, we first have model inputs. And there are five main model inputs, ocean currents, habitats, life history traits, the biomass abundance or cover, depending on what species we're modeling, and then local knowledge um, to ensure that any global data sets um, are accurate or as accurate as possible. Um, and so the model outputs, we are, we're looking at movement patterns, as I mentioned, and then the probability of larval settlement in habitat patches. And products, we're looking at the connectivity matrix, which describes how larvae are moving from one habitat patch to another, um, and then visualizing that matrix in migration maps and connectivity metric maps, which I will show you guys some examples of in a few minutes. All right. Um, so Caitlin, if you could press play on this one. <laughs> okay, so this is an example. Um, of what the model is doing. Um, so each one of these polygons is a habitat patch. And so, like I said, we're simulating how these larvae are moving across the seascape. And with this information, we can then um, transform this information into metrics that can allow and enable resource managers to use this type of visualization or model um, to make decisions about where to protect or where to zone. Next. So how, how does this work exactly? Um, so the simulations is, is pretty straightforward. Um, We're simulating adult spawning, whether it's a fish, a coral, or another invertebrate, um, how they travel across the ocean currents, 
So the hydrodynamic model or the ocean current model um, is critical in this process as those larvae are being released in the larval dispersal model and then traveling across those currents. And then they're settling when they reach their habitat. So the habitat maps are being used to identify the areas where we can tell the model to, to settle the larvae. Um, and the multi-species approach, we've, we've used um, the model to simulate movement across um, acropora species, um, octopus, various fish species, and mud crab. Um, and these are the different life history traits, some of the different life history traits that go into the model. So that spawning period time, how long they spend in the water column, <clears throat> and then where, what types of habitats they're settling in. So we're gonna be focusing on the, the Philippines examples today. Um, so this is an example of on the left, you'll see the map of the model um, extent. So each one of those blue polygons is a habitat patch. Um, and so we modeled dispersal of 10 species across the Philippines. Um, the map on the right will show you a, a product of the migration map. Um, and so what this is showing you is the migration from low, medium, high from one of those patches to another. Um, and then the, the direction of that migration is in a clockwise direction. Next. And from those migration matrices or that the quantification of the larvae that are moving from one patch to another, we developed three main connectivity metrics, um, export, import, and self-recruitment. So why are these important? High export areas supply larvae to replenish depleted populations. High import areas receive diverse and abundant larvae, improving potential for recovering um, from overfishing or any other um, natural catastrophe or threat um, to those populations. Um, the high import areas also increase the potential for genetic um, diversity as well. Um, the high self-recruitment amplifies the benefits of local management because larvae leaving a reef are likely to return back to that same reef. Um, so the efforts to manage and conserve local habitats have a direct positive effect on replenishing and sustaining populations within those areas. Next. So the way that we've been thinking about this is to select a priority area. We're looking for all of these things, I, um, ideally. Often this is not possible, so we'll look at one um, metric um, over another. But ideally, we're looking for priority areas that receive larvae um, from multiple sources, receive lots of larvae from lots of places. Um, which is looking at the volume of those larvae and the diversity of the larvae that are supplying the area. And then also the areas um, that produce larvae that stay within its boundaries, um, as I'd mentioned before, the amplifying the, the, the benefits of that local management back to itself. And then the export function, um, which is the supply function. And is this area supplying larvae to support ecosystems and fisheries across the region? Next. These figures um, show larval migration routes to and from um, Comotes in the Philippines. So the migration routes, as I said, run in a clockwise direction. Um, and the strongest larvae transport are represented by the darkest red lines. So here you can see the extent where larvae are going, where that source or export area um, from Camotes, and where the larvae are coming from um, that settle in, in Camotes. So with this information, we can identify areas within Camotes that are well connected to other reefs um, and prioritize those areas um, for protection. We can also identify municipalities um, or regions that are dependent on one another for larvae transport. And this can guide decisions around forming alliances or agreements across regions um, that can result in a greater collective benefit. Next. 
So then when we're taking this approach um, to a network effect, um, we're again looking, this is an example of potential zoning within an MPA, zoning of no take zones um, or any other area-based management approach, um, selecting those areas that again, have those high import, high export um, that are connected to one another and also connected outside of the, the no-take zones so that they are replenishing not only themselves um, within those no-take zones, but are then providing a broader benefit to the area, to the fisheries, to the ecosystem um, as a collectively. Next. And so incorporating connectivity data, um, this data is not meant to be used in a vacuum, um, as has been mentioned by Nicole as well. Um, so thinking about where habitats, where are the habitats that are well connected, um, also incorporating into the design of protected areas, the habitats that are used across life cycles. So um, do species move as adults? Um, and, and can we incorporate all of those habitats into protected areas? Um, looking at the quality of those habitats. So the, the larval dispersal model does assume quality because of its scale. Um, we don't have um, in water surveys or habitat quality data in all of across the entire domain. Um, so we do have to assume. So we are very reliant on local knowledge and folks just jumping in the water to, to make sure that these, these areas are quality and that we protect the the quality habitats. Um, also the size that supports key species. So size is a very important component as well to, to design of um, protected areas and then minimizing threats. And on top of this, um, incorporating all of the social um, aspects, political aspects um, into, this, into this complex decision-making landscape. And so when you bring all of this together, this is what <laughs> this can look like. Um, so in this map, you'll see there's a larval export that are represented by the, um, the polygons, the red polygons, and we've um, categorized them from low to high. Um, larval import are the points, again, categorized from low to high um, by size. Um, we brought in some, some coral cover um, data as well. Um, and then the overall um, habitat maps, um, and then bringing in some of the other boundaries of existing protected areas to, to make those decisions around um, where to either focus for new zoning, expanded zoning, um, enforcement efforts, um, the data can be, can be um, used in a variety of ways. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to June. Uh, yeah, good good morning, good evening, wherever you are. No? So this is June Amolo from Rare Philippines. I'll be sharing uh, how the data on larval dispersal along with other maps, other information generated from the models that uh, Courtney was uh, presenting in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, before that, I'd like to provide some context. Like, you know, in the Philippines, one of our uniqueness of our marine protected area or marine local laws is really the uh, management of coastal and fishery resources, which devolved into the city or municipal government. So the first uh, 15 kilometer of this water is really managed by uh, local governments, municipalities, or cities. You know, they have the jurisdiction. They can pass laws, they can enforce laws, and uh, declare areas for resource protections. And so there are, in, and national government also can declare uh, areas with uh, uh, greater conservation values and declare it also as protected area. So in, in some areas or in, in many parts of the country, there are big marine protected areas and within it are small no take zones, no, which are uh, primarily used for you know, fishery enhancement, and then because this is uh, the laws is devolved at the local government unit or the municipalities, 
community engagement is very crucial, is key for the buy-in of, of these policies, of this effective, uh, for resource protection to be effective. So yeah, municipalities, peoples are very much engaged in designing, in in creating these areas, no take zones and mine protected areas in their waters in the first 15 kilometers. Next slide, please. So if you look at it, if you look at the municipal water, uh, you need to manage who's fishing, who's using within this municipal water. Plus you need to also establish a important, uh, well-connected, uh, adequate size of reserve where no take zones, no fishing, no uh, human activity is is uh, allowed. So if, if you look at a municipal water, a, a areas under the cities, you kind of manage this. There are areas that are you know management is uh, uh, access who's man who's accessing who's using that is you need to talk to the community as well as you need to talk to the community on where areas not to fish as a replenishment area or no takes on air. So that is always a a a a the scenario in the in the local government in the municipal government. Next slide please. Next slide please. So that's a challenge in uh, in the Philippines we have more than 800 coastal municipalities. So each municipality has to identify uh, no take zones as well as manage areas around around it within that municipal water and then we're using the larval dispersal maps that courtney and this group along with the uh, many of the scientists that have been involved to present to identify priority areas connected habitats and we also use a markson model to really prioritize 20 percent of this habitat to be under uh, no take zone or under uh, strict protection no so in, in identifying that you need to have those information those models as your way to convince a uh, local community or as a tool for community to decide as to where this no take zone should be established so we do have we ask them the priority species uh who's using where the extent of the habitat the mangrove the seagrass as well as we ask you know we do have ocean circulation data in, in the country. So this becomes now a basis for community dialogue in establishing no take zone. So I'd like to zoom into one of uh, the sites in uh, Southeastern Philippines in Shagao. Next slide, please. So Shagao is both a national protected seascape and there's also municipal six, eight now nine municipalities also uh, have uh, jurisdiction within these waters. No, so it's a it's a known uh, surfing uh, capital in the Philippines. So, and currently it has around twenty no takes on over twenty no takes on only covering ten percent of a critical reef habitats. So, the idea is to expand these areas, use larval dispersal maps, uh, to identify priority areas, uh, and bring this information to the community level. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, so in Shargao, the top fish are parrot fish, emperor, the shrubbed fish, and uh, cantoids. And we use this, you know, as mentioned by Courtney, information to model the the larval source as well as the uh, sink of this uh, important species as a top species harvested by uh, the fishers. No, and although our mangrove is protected by law already, no more cutting of mangroves in the Philippines. And we also noticed that in Shargao Island, the northern portion and the southern portion of the islands are key important larval sink. You know? So uh, we put, give this to, bring this to the community and let the community decide as to where to uh, establish this no-take zone. So next slide, please. Uh, next, please. So we have this, for example, one of the municipality in, in Chargao, General Luna. You know? This is one of the surfing capital. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have map of mangroves. Next slide, and 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 seagrass, as well as the uh, the coral reef. Uh, next slide, please. So we do have maps of those habitats, and then these are community drone maps. No? And then we also presented. Next slide, please. We also presented a, and we did also Mantato survey to establish uh, coral condition. Uh, 
in, in this reef. And next slide, please. And then based on the model, we've identified that this area, the red areas are important larval sink and we ask the community to decide if we can put in no take zone here. And then next slide, please. And then they've identified uh, this, you know, red uh, proposed marine sanctuary. I say almost 500 hectare marine sanctuary, and they were able to decide. And this becomes a uh, community agrees on it. There's a regulation already that has been uh, enacted to declare the area as no take zones. Next slide, please. And this is a uh, um, next uh, next slide. And this is happening in many of the rare Philippine sites in the country. You know, this is, for example, in uh, Negros uh, Oriental in one of the sites. No, this is the municipal water. The red uh, areas are the no-take zones based on those models also that suggest that these are key areas, larval sinks and or sources areas. And then around it are zones. No, different zones have different users. No, uh, in in those municipal water. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, example of, of those rules. No? In some areas, only registered fisher can fish using certain types of gears. The other one allowed from other municipalities can fish. And here in these areas, there's like a certain gears are only allowed at certain seasons. So these are regulations that's a bit agreed uh, by the fishers, by the community based on those uh, larval dispersal map along with other uh, community discussions. Uh, in the municipal, in the local government, uh, I'd like to go uh, pass it back to Courtney for the conclusion. Thanks, June. Um, so I wanted to touch on quickly about what is needed to to do this type of work. So the we've used um, models that were developed by Eric Tremel and Dan Holstein, um, and and they have been the ones that are running these models. Um, so substantial computing power is required, experts are required. Um, the scale depends on the resolution of the model. Um, We're also working with hydrodynamic modelers to develop high resolution hydrodynamic models. Um, and so that we can answer questions at a higher resolution. Um, and so the cost really depends on how big of an area you're talking about um, and um, if you need the hydrodynamic model and the larval dispersal model. If you're in an area where we've already run these models, um, it will be a much lower cost because you can just use that data. Um, so that data is available um, for use. And um, the time to develop the model to map production is about four to six months. If you start from scratch, um, if you use existing data, then it's much faster as you'll just need to analyze analyze the data. And I'm happy to talk more in detail about any of that and, and also about any of the, the models that we've used to, to simulate the larval dispersal. Next. So in conclusion, um, protecting critical, protecting connected habitats um, is critical, um, as we all know. Um, so the cumulative effect of those local efforts that are connected can enhance broader fisheries recover and protection of the critical habitats. So using connectivity data at various scales um, can help amplify the effects of local efforts. Um, and um, on that note, incorporating connectivity and decision making can help achieve um, objectives at national, regional, and local scales. And that's it for us. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to all our speakers. Um, that was really great. We're going to now open it up for a question and answer session. So I'll ask all the speakers to um, turn your cameras back on. And just as a reminder to participants, you can type your question into the Q&A box and I'll read it, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you to unmute yourself. And we had a couple of questions that were coming in throughout. So I'm gonna start um, with those. So this one was for Nicole. What is the eDNA entry point equipment cost? What is the cost of supplies to run a eDNA sample? I'm gonna turn that straight over to Jason. Okay, perfect. He just did it all. <laughs> yeah, it's super, it couldn't be more simple. You know, it's a, a kit that you get 
that we got from a, a lab that costs two hundred dollars, and it comes with everything from gloves to the filter that you need. Filter a liter of water, mail it back to them, and a week later, you've got your data and analysis. Great, thanks, um, Nicole. This was also for you. What were some management decisions that were informed by the analyses? That you conduct. okay thank yeah thank you um yeah and I, I also want to point out that the list of people involved in, in doing this work is so long and so i i want to give a shout out to every one of them because it's such a collaborative project that we have um one of the first things that people did was reinstate a number of their traditional management um, plans i guess you could call them so uh, for example on the small island of Falalup, they decided to divide the island in half and the reef owner on one half decided to close it to for example spearfishing because they recognized that some of those fish were were crucial to coral larval recruitment and success uh, because of their role cleaning the reefs so that was one thing that happened and they showed an increase in their fish biomass within gosh eight months they almost doubled their biomass amazingly quickly so that's one of the first things that's happened is in recognition of, of movement and have islands sharing different organisms that people recognize that you can't manage in a vacuum. And so they came together to think about how they could work together. And they're now currently forming um, an island-wide, an atoll-wide sort of council that, that works between the different clans, which they haven't had in the past. So those are all things that have informed, have been informed in part by the connectivity work and the other work that we're, that we're doing out there. Uh, great, thanks. Um, here's a question that came in during Courtney's talk, but I think it could probably go to any of you. In what instances would larvae export be high, but import is low? Courtney, why don't you go ahead with that one? Sure. Um, in lots of cases, they're correlated, um, but there are in some cases um, where the export, so self-recruitment, for instance, could be high and export could be high, um, or export is relatively higher than import. Um, if this is the case, um, there's going to be some, some challenges there. Um, so these types of things can also um, identify some of the challenges um, that could, that some reefs could be facing. Um, how high, um, but the dynamics will will depend on the accuracy of the hydrodynamic models, the accuracy of the larval dispersal models as well. Um, so those are some examples, but usually um, they're pretty correlated. I would say you can sometimes have differences. For example, currents can create differences in export and import, or you could have a, a reef that is primarily exporting. Um, and if it's receiving larvae from a reef that's degraded or in trouble, it's gonna have a lower import uh, from those reefs. And so it's gonna start, it's gonna keep putting out, but not receiving. So these are all really important questions when it comes to thinking about um, what are the impacts when you've got a, a, let's say an island effect of a healthy reef and surrounded by a whole bunch of bleached reefs or reefs that are damaged. Or so what happens when that healthy reef keeps putting out larvae, but it's not receiving enough? Yeah. And also just to clarify, our export and import metrics consider both the volume and the diversity. So you could have, a for the metrics that we're using, you could have a low export value if the volume is low, but the diversity is high. Actually, you asked the other way. So if you have a high export, it could be that the volume is high, but the diversity is low. Um, so it, it's considering both of those um, components in the metric that we're using. Great, thanks. Uh, let's see. Nicole, you mentioned that the genetic connectivity presents parallels with the social connectivity. Can you speak more about that? Did you measure social connectivity? And if so, what are the relationships between the social and genetic connectivity? Yeah, so I, I wish that Magul was on the call, but if he is, he would speak up. <laughs> um, so what we found is that the, the main parallel is that connectivity goes both through people and through organisms and the physical environment. So those things are all connected. And 
I think one of the main things we found is that two of the jurisdictions that had not worked together for quite a while actually were the ones that shared full siblings of two of the different fish that we were looking at. And that was really exciting to them. And they realized that if they don't work together, since they do share their fish, if they don't work together, if they do work together, they can gain a lot more. So so we have, we're actually right now beginning that the process to answer more of that question. So we're having the communities map their jurisdictions. We're having the youth actually work with their elders to try to regain some of that knowledge and to map those jurisdictions. And we're going to overlay those onto the connectivity. So the map I showed you of jurisdictions is a sort of our initial map from our talking to people. Um, we've now put it in their hands. So we're asking each of them to more fully map all their jurisdictions so we can overlay that on the connectivity. So we're in the process of doing that. It's actually really fun. They're, they're, they're having a lot of fun doing it. And it's, it's, I think it's rekindling a lot of interest in the youth about jurisdictions and management, what has been lost and what they can recover. I hope I answered that question. Uh, let's see. We have a question for June. When you say that you're sharing the larval dispersal results with the community, are you talking about the municipal level or do you have interactions with the barangay level, if I'm saying that correctly, for the creation of these no-take zones? Yeah, this is really at the both municipal and barangay or the village level. So you're really talking, you're presenting the map to fishers or gleaners or other, you know, resource users in the coastal zone at the village level. And then they get to input their their their, their decision as to where to put these no take zones so both village and municipal level. Um, there's a question, what management strategies are being used to reduce the Montipara coverage and restore the reefs? That's a really good question. So initially the people asked us exactly what that, that question, what should we do? And we don't like to be in the business of telling them what to do because I don't know if it's going to work or not. Um, they wanted to know, for example, should we bleach it? Should we throw chemicals on it? Should we hammer it up? You know, should we physically, what should we do? And, you know, our suggestion was just leave it alone. And, and see if if sort of the reefs can take their own course, which they have in some cases. That Mog Mog example I told you is exactly that. So that was really interesting for us to see that it, it, there can be some solutions just based on what happens naturally. Um, other than that, uh, there's the, the best way that, the advice we gave to people is manage for your fish because it's much easier to manage for fish than it is for corals. Cause you know, it's, unless you're planting corals, which they're not. So that's what they decided to do. And Mog Mog was one of the places that managed pretty heavily for their fish. So they they restricted the take of a lot of their herbivorous fish. And so, you know, I don't know if that's what drove that resilience or not, but it was probably a factor. So that's really what we're, you know, sort of proposing to them is that they really think about the fish because that's what they're eating and that's what they're catching. So it's the easiest thing for them to think about. And, and I'll just say a quick comment here about MPA. So the, the places where we work are autonomously governed so that people can make decisions about their reefs, which I think is really, it makes it much easier for them. Um, No-take MPAs that are imposed on these people can actually be devastating because they are managed by families and clans. And if you take away somebody's access to a reef, it actually creates a lot of social instability. So this is why we're really embedding all this stuff within their own management system. And, and I, I think we're super lucky to be able to do that because it is a place that is managed by the local people. Okay, hey, thanks. Has there been any attempt to assess the vulnerability of connectivity patterns to projected future changes? Are these likely to be durable in the context of climate change? Courtney, yours is the big model. So I'd say that's going to be huge for you. Yeah. And the answer is yes. Um, but that's a huge, huge area of focus <laughs> um, on how will all of this change, um, depending on how the temperatures change, how currents change. Um, so we've been working with the University of Tasmania to, to look at the effects of, of temporal changes. So we have been looking at 
how, because we're also, I guess, to clarify one thing, that the, the model that we're using is using 20 years of hydrodynamic data, um, but it is taking an average over those 20 years. So we're also looking at the variability, um, the temporal variability within those years and how that changes um, where you would, would protect. Um, but then looking further into the future on how current patterns will change under different climate scenarios, um, Yes, but to be determined. <laughs> um, and um, things are going to change, and the areas that are that are optimal for protection are going to change. Um, the species that are even there are going to change. So I mean, that's a big that's a big question um, and a big need to understand those impacts. It's a huge question. I think we're addressing that question, looking at resilience through the human lens and really encouraging strengthening management as much as we can, given the fact that we can't really project it so far into the future that way. Um, but any management is gonna be helpful and useful. And so, and people need to eat from those reefs. And so for them, they can't really close them down to no fishing. However, strengthening the management around some of these key fish that we know are moving around between the reefs um, is really, all that we can do to look ahead is to just strengthen that management in the best way that we can. And then we continue to provide the science behind it so that people can continue to be informed. And, and that's the resource piece, the science resource piece to so many Ivan communities. If they can get some of that information as they're managing, it helps them adapt. Yeah, and just to echo that, um, you know, getting this data, even if it's not modeled for the future, like Nicole said, if we get this data into the hands of the people who can use it, um, and then if we need, if we refine the information, then they're equipped and have the capacity to use it. Um, and you know, June's talked about that, and teams like Rare and other organizations that are working directly with the communities to build that capacity to to use the information, and that's huge. Okay, I think we only have time for one more question. Um, has anyone explored different human intervention strategies to support or fast track the natural processes that help to restore degraded reefs, especially in areas that are of social significance? Maybe we can ask June that. I don't know if you have thought in your strategies about um, restoration strategies with your the connectivity data that you've been handed on over. Um, although uh, restoration, uh, that's for me, right? Yeah, question. Uh, correct. Yes. Uh, so, although yes, we many, please, thanks. Uh, although in the country there's very few organizations that's really looking into restoration of degraded reef, no, but um, we are. Um, I don't know of maybe one or two organizations that have been you know, looking into restoration, but. Right now, uh, the focus is really much on uh, identifying uh, reef connected, you know, highly you know, source or sink reef to protect it from uh, add further further degradations from you know you know overfishing or other issues. Uh, and then so yeah, that's that's more of the focus. But yeah, we're very much willing to share this informations to organizations that really looking into restorations uh right now i think only like you know academic organization are trying to do restoration in in, in some of the reef yeah. Great, thanks. That concludes uh, this webinar. So I just want to once again thank all of our wonderful wonderful speakers and the rest of you for being here with us. Um, the recording will be made available in the next few days. Uh, we'll also probably pick a few of the outstanding questions and have those answered by our speakers and send that out. And um, the article summary is here. Uh, we have a number that are available on the Reef Resilience, Reef Resilience Network site, and we will send links to these as well. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Reef Resilience Network or have any further um, questions or conversation you'd like to have with speakers, please feel, feel free to reach out to us at the Reef Resilience Network. We can put you in touch. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.